Genesis 49, if you want to turn there, where the second part of Jacob's blessing, which is really Jacob's prediction or, or prophecy about Israel uh, in the latter days. And um, it's always almost a little sad to get to the end of the book. It's like reading a good novel, and it's been really good. You almost have to hate to come to that last chapter and know that it's going to end. And uh, it's been quite a study. And uh, I think we're coming up on... Uh, closing in on about two years, going through the, the book of Genesis, and uh, uh, it is uh, so foundational to so many uh, other things that we need to know in terms of scripture. Again, the creation, the fall, the flood, the creation of nations, and then the choosing of, of one man uh, to carry out God's uh, message, Abraham, uh, focusing on him, uh, his son Isaac, his son Jacob, and then these are Jacob's uh, last, uh, last words, really predicting things in the future, in the last days, he says in verse 1. He said that was kind of the key to understanding chapter 49. You could just read this and assume that he is saying something to each of his 12 sons, something about their future, something about their past, uh, based on some of the things that they have done in their, in their own lives. For example, we looked at Reuben last week, uh, and, uh, and we talked about uh, his own uh, immorality. And, uh, and there's a prediction there's going to be more immorality in the future. Uh, and again, you would miss it if you thought it was talking about him or his immediate descendants as he went into the land of Israel. And certainly there's some hint of that and parallels of that. But this is all talking about Israel in the future, that uh, this idea of immorality would be a, a tremendous problem for them in the last days. And we certainly easy to make the application of uh, our own culture and society that we live in. Secondly, we looked at Simeon and Levi. We were warned about a future problem of anger and cruelty that would be in the world in the last days. It certainly have implications uh, for the, the nation of, of Israel. Uh, and then in Judah, we saw the beautiful prophecies concerning Jesus Christ, his first coming, his second coming. And, uh, and again, if all we had was, was Jacob's prophecy, it would be kind of hard to kind of dial these things up and really see exactly what he was talking about. But when we have a reference to uh, that, that the Messiah is going to be the lion of the tribe of Judah, and it's got something to do with the donkey and a foal of a colt, well, we kind of get it, you know, because uh, Zechariah comes along later and says he's actually going to ride into the city, declare himself to be the Messiah. And, of course, uh, we see that in what we refer to as Palm Sunday. Uh, the same thing. We have a reference to the Messiah that when he comes, his robes, in a sense, are going to look like they've been dyed in wine or covered in wine or grape juice. That alone would have been like, well, that's interesting, except that, uh, again, Isaiah 63 says that when the Messiah comes the second time uh, to rescue uh, the remnant of Jewish believers that are out there in the plains of Jordan, near the uh, rock city of Petra in Hebrew it refers to uh, as Basra is the way that Isaiah puts it not the Basra in Iraq but the one in present day Jordan and as he rescues that remnant of Jews and makes his way back to the Mount of Olives where he will stand on it and it will split in two Isaiah says uh, it will look like his robes are covered in blood uh, it just like grapes would be so again if we just had what Jacob said we'd be like uh, okay so what does that have to do with? But when we combine that with other scripture, it kind of fills out the picture. Those are all things that we looked at last week. In fact, we noted seven aspects of Judah's descendant, uh, Jesus Christ, in his first coming, his second coming, and aspects of his death on the cross for us. We continue with son number five, Zebulun. And we see that there's a prediction of international trade, and that's in verse 13 where we begin. Zebulun shall dwell by the haven of the sea. He shall become a haven for ships, and his border shall adjoin Sidon. So uh, again, once in the land, uh, uh, Zebulun's uh, territory, again, is divided under uh, Joshua's uh, uh, leadership. He does end up with a seaport, what we would say today is Akko. Uh, he also has the uh, access to the Kishon River, which gives him access to, to the sea. So there's some element, yeah, in a sense, his descendants experience this. But again, we're talking about the latter days, the future days. Would Israel be involved in international trade in the latter days? That's what this says, and certainly we live in those days. 
uh, in an incredible uh, uh, display of, uh, of their involvement, certainly in terms of exporting all of their goods and services uh, around the world. They're, they're one of the uh, great expo exporters of uh, the high-tech in industry. That's why Microsoft and other companies like it have poured millions of dollars into facilities uh, uh, into Israel because of all the breakthroughs and those things are exported around the world. That's why uh, your little smartphone can do some of the things it does is because of technologies that have been developed in Israel. I've got an older statistic. This is from 2000, 12 years old, but uh, even at that time, Israel exported $50 million annually of flowers to Europe. You ever have a chance to go to Europe and stroll down those streets and see all those beautiful flower shops? You can know that most of those flowers all came from the tiny nation of Israel. And it's the same thing in terms of fruits uh, uh, and vegetables. And one of the things about being in Israel, because uh, again, all that you see here about Israel uh, is certainly sl slanted and we don't really get to see all that God has done in the country. You see Israel, you see some kid throwing rocks down the Gaza Strip. Uh, you don't get to see the plains of Sharon that are covered with oranges, grapefruit, uh, and lemons. You don't get to see the hills around the Galilee that are covered with uh, banana, kiwi, and avocados, and, uh, and on and on. It's, it's really a sight to behold. It's great to be there and see just the archaeological sites alone. But to see this aspect predicted by the prophet Ezekiel, that when they were back in the land, uh, they would have this abundance of uh, agricultural development, uh, and uh, we live in the day when Zebulun, who lives by the sea, again, Israel, it's a haven for ships. There's tremendous international trade that's taken place. Now, Moses writing later in, uh, in Deuteronomy 33, verse 18 and 19, seems to at least to maybe allude to this. He says there, And of Zebulun, he said, Rejoice, Zebulun, in your going out, and Ishikar in your tents, they shall, in the future, they shall call the peoples to the mountain. Uh, there they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness, for they shall partake of the abundance of the seas and of treasures hidden in the sand. Abundance of the seas, treasures hidden in the sands. And uh, again, Moses is not necessarily attributing this to the last days or the latter days, but he does say this will be the case in the future, and it certainly seems to tie in with this passage here with Jacob. Uh, have they done that? Are they doing that? Well, we know about eight months or a year ago, tremendous discoveries offshore oil reserves off uh, the coast of Israel that they've worked out agreements uh, in sharing rights with the island or the people group of uh, Cyprus, and, uh, and there's a tremendous wealth. They, they have, expect to be completely energy uh, uh, free from other countries and so forth uh, in the very near, near future. Uh, they certainly are going to be partaking of the abundance of the sea, and it's not fish. <laughs> and they certainly have found a few treasures uh, hidden in the sand. But uh, here's a reference to Zebulun or taking of the abundance of the seas, a prediction of international trade. Secondly, there's a loss of independence for the Jewish people in their future, in the last days, seen in the son Ishikar, verse 14. Ishikar is a strong donkey lying down between two burdens. He saw that rest was good and that the land was pleasant. He bowed his shoulder to bear a burden and became a band of slaves. And you could look at that in a lot of different translations, but it still comes down to that of this loss of of independence, like a strong donkey, willing to work and so forth, but uh, there is slavery or a loss of independence in the future for Israel. And of course, they suffered the uh, slavery of Egypt for 400 years. We know because Joseph goes off the sea and that, that dynasty that he served under, the Hiskos dynasty that was not Egyptian, goes to the side, another pharaoh rises up from the south, who is Egyptian, he takes over. He wants to make sure that no non-Egyptians can once again usurp the authority of the Egyptian people. And so then he puts uh, the Jewish people, therefore, under bondage and under slavery. But again, that's not in the last days. They have certainly have incurred other times of bondage, again, under the Babylonians, under the Greeks, under the Romans. But again, that's not in the last days. So this is still yet future. They're certainly not uh, in slavery today, but we know that during the Great Tribulation, there will be a, a horrific time uh, for the Jewish people. And Jesus speaks about it in Luke 21, verse 20. There Jesus says, but when you see Jerusalem 
surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Woe to those who are pregnant, to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword. And there it is, be led away captive. That's what we're talking about, into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles in t until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So there's a future time, Jesus says, that agrees with this, when many will be led into captivity. Now we know that a segment, or we say a remnant, because that's the term the Bible uses, are going to be able to get away and flee out into the plains of Jer Jericho, or excuse me, Jordan, and head for uh, the rock city of Petra. Uh, when will this happen? Well, it's going to happen when the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And I've heard for uh, many years that the idea of the times of the Gentiles being fulfilled refers to Gentile con converts. And that when there's, because there's only two groups of people in the Bible, you're either Jewish or you're Gentile. So when, when the Gentiles, the people of the nations, when there's uh, the last one of those is saved, then that's the end of the times of the Gentiles. Uh, I've also heard that, uh, uh, again, it's, from a Jewish perspective, it's talking about the rule of Jerusalem and who controls Jerusalem because Jerusalem has been under the control of Gentiles for a very long time. Uh, there's been a few times in period where the Jews regain uh, control of the city as they have right now, but we know that they're going to lose it again. Again, the word time here when it says times of the Gentiles does not refer to chronological time. The word refers to seasons of times and suggests gaps in times. This could refer to different kinds of nations that have controlled Jerusalem in, uh, in the past. Uh, and again, they lost control in, uh, in 70 AD, uh, did not regain it until the Yom Kippur War in 1967. Uh, but they had lost it and regained it under the Maccabean period, 164 to 163 BC. They lost it, uh, uh, but regained it under Rome in the uh, revolt of 66 to 70 AD. And of course, we know what happens under Titus and the Roman legions uh, in 70 AD. There's a second revolt called the Barcopa Revolt in 130 AD to 135, and they regained control uh, a little bit at that time. By the way, when, when uh, the Rome comes in and puts down that revolt for the last time, completely decimates the temple, uh, and uh, destroys everything. At that point, they renamed the land after the ancient foes of Israel, the Philistines, and began to call it Palestine. We say Palestine today. That's why it's kind of offensive to Jewish people who've had their own nation since 1948 for people to just keep calling it Palestine. It's not Palestine, it's the land, uh, land of Israel. It was named Palestine by the Romans after the Bar Kokhba revolt. Uh, it's currently, again, since 1967, they regained uh, uh, that territory once again. When the UN initially divided or partitioned and made room for an Isra uh, Israeli state, for a Jewish state, uh, the, uh, it did not include what is today called the West Bank or Jerusalem. That was given over to Jordan, which is the Palestinian state. Do we need another Palestinian state? We got one. It's called Jordan. That's where the Palestinians live. Uh, and they lived under the uh, Hussein dynasty. They're there. And uh, in 67, when Israel knew they were going to be attacked by Egypt and by the Syrians, uh, they basically told the Jordanians that they have a good relationship with, don't get involved. You know, just stay away. Don't get involved. Uh, Jordan has no, has no oil. They got no money. Uh, they basically are able to enjoy the economy of Israel. Uh, and their folks come across the border and work jobs in Israel and go back. That they actually had very good relationships. But under pressure from the other Muslim Arab states, they got involved and they also attacked then from the east. Therefore, when Israel was able to drive Egypt deep back into their territory, drive the Assyrians off the Golan Heights, uh, back toward Damascus and secure those borders and take it over, and they were able to drive the Jordanians out, they took over then what was called the West Bank today and the city of Jerusalem for the first time in 2,000 years. Uh, it was uh, a pretty amazing day. There's some great uh, uh, 
uh, vintage footage of the uh, IDF soldiers making their way, fighting their way through to get into the city of Jerusalem for the first time uh, in 2,000 years. But uh, they had control of the Temple Mount for a few days and then re, uh, relinquished control of that in order to sign a peace deal to keep, again, the rest of the Muslim nations from uh, another attack against the city. So they don't control the Temple Mount, but they control Jerusalem today. But it's just for a period of time. Again, uh, the times of the Gentiles has to do with who controls uh, Israel uh, in their capital, Jerusalem. Paul says this in Romans 11:25. He says, I, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Ge uh, Gentiles has come in. There's our, uh, our line again. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. There's going to be a future time where Israel goes into bondage once again, into slavery, according to Jesus, into all the nations. It's going to happen during the Great Tribulation under the oppression of the Antichrist. They're going to lose possession of that city once again. They are able to take it and lose it. Take it and lose it. The times of the Gentiles are times not chronologically, but gaps of times where they have the city and then they lose it again. But they will regain it once again. When? When the deliverer comes out of Zion. Who's that? That's Jesus Christ. When he returns for that remnant, and we'll talk about how many that is here uh, in a moment, uh, and what will happen when the Messiah comes. Zechariah 12.10 says of Jesus, the Messiah at that time, at the end of the tribulation, and I will pour out on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication, then they will look on me whom they have pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. In that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning at Hadad Rimon uh, in the plain of Megiddo. So, uh, again, the Holy Spirit was poured out on all flesh there in Acts chapter 2, all mankind. But uh, in particular, there'll become a time at the end of the tribulation after an enslavement of the people, of uh, the Jewish people, where God pours his spirit out on them uh, once again. And it's because they are crying out to him uh, and uh, asking him to come back, recognizing that he is the Messiah. Jesus said of the Jewish nation, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The recognition that he is the Messiah, it will come, it will come at the end of the tribulation. And that's what ushers Jesus Christ back to planet earth, Revelation 19, uh, with us with him in terms of the bride of Christ uh, coming with him to rule and reign. Are you kind of wishing you had another cup of Starbucks on the way? How are you doing? <laughs> I'm giving you the whole David Talking Prophecy Conference in 45 minutes. <laughs> I think I better email him and say, whatever you do, David, don't cover Genesis 49. We're just in it for two weeks. Interesting what uh, Jacob is predicting. He's predicting that the, uh, in the latter days, there'll be international trade uh, with the Jewish state. There'll be an independence that's lost, uh, and, it's, and it's not going to get regained until the times of the Gentiles are over. That's not going to end until they cry out and for the one that will come uh, from out of Zion. Uh, it will be Jesus Christ himself. Third thing is there'll be a tribe that becomes infamous for causing his brothers to stumble. And that's Dan, verse 16 and 17. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that his rider shall fall backwards. And I know that sounds a little cryptic, but obviously Dan's going to be a judge. He's going to be a leader. That's pretty straightforward in the future. And, uh, uh, he, but he's going to be, in this metaphor, he's like a serpent by the side of the road. A horse goes by, and he bites its heel, causing that horse and the rider, therefore, to fall backward. That's the uh, image, and that's the, the picture that we have of Dan. So this is going to take place in the future in the latter days in regards to the nation of Israel. What will make the nation of Israel fall backwards? 
And I think it's in regards to falling backwards spiritually. Well, I think we have a big hint of that in terms of what Dan, the tribe of Dan, became infamous for uh, when they were in the land. They became famous for calf worship, for idol worship. Remember when the two kingdoms divided? You had a united kingdom under Saul, under David, under Solomon. And then Solomon's son, Rehoboam, takes over. He decides to, to raise everybody's taxes. So in a sense, the kingdom splits over money, over taxes. Uh, and so Jeroboam, no relation to Rehoboam. Why do did, why did their names have to be similar? I don't understand this. But So Jeroboam goes to the north of the ten tribes. And uh, we're going to read from 1 Kings 12, 25. You'll see his concern. His concern is that, yeah, we're up there. We're united. We're on our own. People are serving me. But if they keep going down to Jerusalem for the three annual feasts, they might say, decide that uh, we better stay down here. And if we're going to stay down here and serve that king, we might as well kill that king. So that's his concern. And he's got a solution for it. Verse 25. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim and dwelt there. Also, he went out from there and built uh, Penuel, and uh, Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn back to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Therefore, the king asked advice, made two calves of gold, said to the people, is it too much for you to go up to Jerusalem? Here are your gods, O Israel, which you brought up from the land of Egypt. And he set up one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Dan becomes infamous for idol worship. And uh, what it did was take those people in those 12 tribes, and it threw them backwards spiritually. It took them back to worshiping the gods of, uh, of Egypt. So, you know, again, is that what Jacob's talking about? I don't think so, because it's not the latter days yet. But I think it also tells us, though, what's going to happen. What is Dan famous for or infamous for? It's for idol worship. By the way, I think I've got a little picture of uh, when we were uh, in Israel the last time. That's Fred in the middle with his little hat on there. But that's the archaeological remains of this temple in Dan. You can see it's, a, it's beautiful up there. It's a forested area near, near Mount uh, Hermon. It's beautiful. Uh, that is the archaeological remains of the temple proper. You can see that metal that's been recreated where the, uh, the actual altar was for this uh, worship of this uh, calf god and so forth. But uh, uh, it's one of the sites that, uh, that we go to there. And this is what Dan becomes famous for in terms of this uh, idol, idol worship. Uh, but again, how, is this get, how does this get fulfilled in the last days? Well, we, we know, again, because of the rest of Scripture, because of Revelation, because of uh, Daniel 9, because what Paul says about the Antichrist, that the Antichrist, this person, again, who is against Christ but like Christ, he's, a, he's a like a Christ figure. He's going to be very charismatic. People will, will love him. He's going to be, bring peace to the Middle East. Is anybody concerned about that? I think there's a few people concerned about that. He's going to bring peace to the Middle East. Uh, and he's going to resolve this issue between the Palestinians and, uh, and the state of, uh, modern state of Israel. Uh, and one of the things he's going to do is he's going to allow them to rebuild the temple there on the Temple, temple Mount, which uh, they, are, they are all ready to go. They've got the priest trained. They have everything, uh, implements all recreated and gold and so forth. It's all ready to go. Uh, we know that the Antichrist will rise, Daniel said, out of a revived Roman Empire. We used to wonder, what will that be like? We don't anymore. It's called the European Union. They don't have a lot of power right now. Things are looking pretty bad in Europe economically, but we know they won't remain that way. There's going to be a guy that arises out of there very powerfully. And we know a few years ago, they appointed uh, a man on their behalf to go out to the nations of the world to cut seven-year covenants and deals and peace treaties with other nations. Seven years. Uh, certainly that would include, if he could do it, this person, a covenant with the nation of Israel. What was the number of the resolution voted on uh, by the European Union in doing that? Wow, it just happened to be 666. Go figure. But uh, so these, so many of these things have already been, been established. And we were kind of tracking that guy for a while, but he's kind of 
return and fade it off the, off the scene. But a lot of things are in place for these things the Bible talked about. Once he cuts that deal, that starts the clock. And we know that 1,260 days later, seven years later, Jesus Christ returns to planet Earth. Revelation 19, what we've been talking about to rescue that, uh, that, uh, that Jewish remnant out there in present day uh, Petra. Uh, but in the process, remember, in the middle of it, the temple is established. Sacrifices are going again. He goes into the temple at the three and a half year mark. So says Daniel. So says the apostle Paul. And he sets himself up uh, an image likened to himself to be worshipped as an idol. He declares himself to be God. And at that point, horrible things like Jesus talked about in Luke 21 begin because there's a holocaust against the Jewish people. They are enslaved, they're killed, they're taken, but there's a remnant that is able to escape because they take the advice of, uh, of Jesus. This is all in the future, of course, but uh, I kind of wonder if not the judges, the leaders of Israel that signed the covenant, I almost wonder if one of them will be from the tribe of Dan. Somehow in the future, there is going to be idolatry brought against and in the temple of God in the future. Dan is famous for it, and Jacob says it will happen again in the latter days. So there's a prediction for international trade. There's a loss of independence for the Jewish people, and there's going to be a stumbling uh, that uh, is from the tribe of Dan or like the tribe of Dan caused <coughs> that is infamous. And note, after all of this, there's a brief moment of intercessory prayer. That's Jacob in verse 18. I have waited for your salvation, O Lord. The NIV says, I look for your deliverance, O Lord. It's almost as if Jacob is saying these things, picturing these things. Hey, international trade, that's great. Uh, it looks like uh, things are going to get worse. The people are going to be enslaved. They might go into idolatry again. It's almost like he stops like this, this is just like a line that just jumps out. It doesn't even fit with the other sins. He's there in his deathbed. He's about ready to die. And he just stops and begins to intercede for uh, his sons and those that would come after them. And then he then goes back to the prophecy in verse 5. Uh, and we would say there in 5 verses 19 to 21, there's an initial failure that will lead to a complete triumph. And he seems to group together, I think very appropriately, Verse 19, 20, 21, Gad, Asher, and Naphtali. What he has to say about them are all one and the same thing. Gad, a troop, shall tramp upon him. Not good. But he shall triumph at the last. That's good. Bread from Asher shall be rich. Sounds like there's a party going on. And he shall yield royal dainties. That sounds very good as well. Naphtali is a deer let loose, a picture of blessing, he uses beautiful words. So how does this, all, all of this mean? Well, again, uh, verse 19, Gad, a troop shall trample upon him. So in the future, in the latter days, there's going to come a time where it doesn't look good for the nation of Israel. It doesn't look good for the Jewish people. It looks like they're going to get annihilated uh, once again. But it all turns around. But he shall triumph. Uh, there'll be a complete triumph uh, by the Jewish people once again. And of course, that's because they cry out to Jesus, the Messiah, the line of the tribe of Judah, who comes back to rescue them at the end of the tribulation period. Of Asher, again, when I said it looks like there's a party going on, the NIV puts verse 20 this way, Asher's food will be rich. He will provide delicacies fit for a king. So there's a complete triumph by Israel, Jacob says, looks bad, and then a complete triumph. There's a celebration. There's food fit for a king. And then Naphtali is a deer let loose, as I mentioned, uh, in terms of uh, Israel uh, in Jewish life. That is a picture of blessing, the deer that's been let loose. Blessings for the nation of Israel. He'll use uh, beautiful words. Looks, doesn't look too good for the nation of Israel today. Pretty much every nation is abandoned, except for one nation. Who is it? Canada. Go figure. But uh, again... Harper, the prime minister there, is born again, evangelical Christian. Uh, their whole parliament has turned over, become very cons uh, conservative in the last three or four years. Right now, they're the only nation standing with, uh, uh, with the nation of Israel in terms of the Iranian threat. Uh, we've got a lot of assets moving into the area, very, 
very quickly if you kind of keep up with the news and, uh, and so forth. And we're kind of waiting to, uh, what, waiting to see what's going to happen with Iran and their uh, nuclear program and uh, with everything else going on in the Middle East. But in the future, again, the Antichrist will arise. Things will look good and then things will look very bad for the Jewish people as so many of them are decimated. Uh, but there will be a remnant that will be spared. The kingdom will come for them. In terms of peace in the Middle East, I appreciate uh, so much of what uh, Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu has to say. Uh, I think rightly compared to uh, Winston Churchill in terms of uh, speaking to the world over the concerns of peace and uh, the evil that's in their world and what needs to be done about it. If you haven't ever heard uh, one of his speeches, he's got one coming up to the United Nations here at the end of the month. And very, he's a statesman. He's more of a statesman than a political guy, very eloquent. Uh, and he was asked at one point in time when there would be peace in the Middle East. And he said that uh, the problem is this. If the Arabs would put down their weapons, we will have peace in the Middle East. But if the Jewish people put down their weapons, we will be annihilated. You know, the, the, the problem is, is very, very one-sided. One of the other former prime ministers of, of Israel uh, was asked one time when there would be peace in the Middle East, and she responded, we'll have peace in the Middle East when our enemies love their children more than they hate us. In other words, if they, when they finally decide they want a future, and they want a future for their kids, and they love them enough, maybe they'll stop hating us. But uh, terrible situation in the Middle East today. But one day, Israel will have a final and a complete victory, but it will not occur until Jesus Christ returns and establishes his millennial reign here on planet Earth. International trade, a loss of independence in the future, an infamous stumbling <clears throat> that I think will occur via the uh, newly rebuilt temple uh, there in the future. A brief moment of intercessory prayer, an initial failure that leads to a complete triumph. And that brings about then verse 20 to 27, where he begins to remark about Joseph, uh, and we would say incredible blessings for the future. Verse 22, Joseph is a fruitful bow, a fruitful bow by a well. His branches run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, and hated him. But his bow remained in strength. It, 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 just as I'm reading, the, this, just figure, this is talking about the nation of Israel, right? Uh, uh, notice the archers have bitterly grieved him, the nation of Israel, shot at him and hated him. But his bow remained in strength, and the arms of his hand were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob, it's El Shaddai. From there is the shepherd. The stone of Israel. Who's the, step, who's the stone of Israel? Who's the shepherd? It's Jesus Christ. By, by the God of your Father who will help you, and by the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breast and of the womb, blessings of your Father, have excelled the blessings of my ancestors up to the most utmost uh, bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph. And on the crown of him who was separate from his brothers. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. Several things about this uh, prophecy concerning Joseph, that's really about Israel in the latter days, is the first thing we know there'll be suffering before there's blessing. The archers have bitterly <laughs> grieved him, shot at him, and hated him. And certainly that's what we, uh, we have today in the, uh, uh, in the nation of Israel. Uh, if you're, if you're kind of wondering why uh, it only seems like there's bad news that comes out of Israel that you see uh, daily on the news, unless you get it from Israel or you get it from some other sources, is because the most widely uh, international news group is CNN uh, International. That uh, We see the, uh, the U.S. affiliate here uh, sometimes uh, on, uh, on TV. Uh, that's if you want to see what the liberals are thinking. You watch it. But, uh, uh, but CNN International and CNN is owned almost 90% by Saudi Arabia. Uh, they've been buying it up for years, and it was a number of years ago when they had the majority uh, shares of stock. Uh, you can understand why their news reporting would be just slightly, slightly <laughs> uh, against uh, the nation of Israel and, and the Jewish people. 
so there's certainly, there's a lot in terms of the bitterness and things that are said that, uh, that grieve him. They've shot at him. Uh, they've, uh, they've hated him. One of the things that, uh, that, that I always see when I get a, a news source or watch a, a video thing coming out of uh, uh, Jerusalem.com or one of the other sites uh, in Israel is that every time there's a, a disaster like in Haiti or Japan or one of the other places, the first people on the ground are almost always Israel because they are the world's leading ex excerpts in, in, uh, in rescue. Uh, they've got the training, they've got the dogs, they've got the medical teams, they're on the flight line ready to go. They're usually the first guys there, because you knew all that, because that's in the news just all the time. People are so appreciative, right? No, it's Israeli doctors that are, uh, that are uh, actually uh, taking care of fleeing Muslims out of Syria right now. Now we've got some guys on the ground up there uh, and probably some assets that maybe aren't supposed to be there. But it's, uh, the Israeli doctors were some of the first uh, medical teams in to care for their enemies. Because you don't get that in the news. Uh, what you get is this. The bitterness, the grieving him, they shot at him, uh, they uh, hated him. Uh, but there's a turn. But his bow remained in strength. Again, the archer's bow. The arms of his hands were made strong. What were they made strong by? El Shaddai, the mighty God of Jacob. And, uh, uh, you know, again, that's where their strength is going to come from. Uh, and we see their strength. Again, first we know that it's, uh, it says, yeah, again, from the strength of God of Jacob. Uh, what's interesting about this is that Jacob knew firsthand El Shaddai because he wrestled with him one night. Remember back in chapter 32? Jacob finally had to learn, how do you find strength from the God Almighty? <laughs> it's when you surrender. <laughs> Uh, he wrestles with him all night long. And finally, you remember, as day begins to break, before he's going to meet his brother Esau, uh, he, uh, he grabs him and hangs on to him and says, bless me, you know. And again, always the inferior to the superior. Please bless me. Uh, and he does. And he even changes his name from Jacob, which means uh, heel catcher, or we might say dirty, sneaky thief. Uh, so he changes his name for that. And uh, sorry if your name is Jacob. It's, it's usurper, but, you know, just kind of a rough translation there. Uh, to Israel, governed, governed by God. Pushes a joint in his hip so he walks with a limp the rest of his life and remembers that incident of what it was to experience the strength of El Shaddai, God Almighty. It says he surrendered. Uh, and, uh, and certainly that's what Israel is going to find out about in the future. They're going to suffer, but they're going to find strength and they're going to find strength when they finally surrender. By the way, who was that angel of the night? It was God Almighty, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. When are they going to find their strength? When they look to Jesus Christ, who is El Shaddai, God Almighty. It's very interesting during the first Persian Gulf War. You remember, remember that guy, Saddam Hussein, and his PR guy, Baghdad Bob, that would come on the news at night, tell everybody how great they were doing? It was so interesting. Anyway, when they were shooting those missiles into Israel, because they wanted to draw Israel into the conflict, if Israel would have engaged, then they could have made a plea to the other uh, Islamic nations around them to jump into this war. Uh, we uh, loaded up Israel with our uh, Patriot, uh, you know, uh, you know anti-missile systems and everything we could do to help them out. But uh, there was interviews with people in their, in their bomb shelters. You guys got a bomb shelter? If you live in Israel, you got a bomb shelter. And by the way, they've been cleaning them, fixing them up, making sure they're well supplied, checking their gas mask. And if you live in an apartment building, you've been running drills in Israel, so you know how to immediately, in a, in a very cordial way, make your way to the, uh, to the bomb shelter in preparation for, uh, for what's coming. In one of those interviews, they asked someone in one of the bomb shelters how they were doing, and they said, our only hope is in the Lord God of Israel. You know, when you got the missiles coming at you from every direction. And that is absolutely true. And there'll be a time in the future uh, when the, all Israel as a nation will recognize that. Zechariah 13, 8 says, And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds of it shall be cut off and die. This is under the hands of the Antichrist. But one-third of it shall be left, left in it. I will bring one-third through the fire. Refine them as silver is refined test them as gold is tested they will call on my name and I will answer them I will say this is my people and each one will say the Lord is my God it's kind of sober there's about 18 million uh, Jewish people in the world today 
uh, that would mean the, the remnant. When we think of the remnant that God saves, some of you think it's like, uh, like a couple dozen families out there or something. This is six million people. Uh, they'll be supernaturally protected uh, by God uh, from the Antichrist. Uh, back in verse 1, Zechariah, that same chapter said, And that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David, for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and uncleanness. And, uh, and it's because they've cried out to God Almighty, Jesus their Messiah, to come and rescue them, and he does. And because of that, there's blessing. Notice verse 25. By the God of your Father who will help you, by the Almighty who will bless you, with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breast and of the womb, the blessings of your Father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors, up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills they shall be on the head of Joseph. Now, if you ask rabbinical scholars, and most of them agree, when will that be fulfilled? They don't just say it will be fulfilled when the Messiah returns and comes for them. They say it will happen in the moment. All those blessings will happen in the moment that, that he returns for them. And I think they might be right. The last part of this thing is about Benjamin. He plays a part in the prediction. Again, Benjamin or again, Israel in the last days, is a ravenous wolf in the morning shall devour the prey and at night divide the spoil. So complete uh, victory, uh, the establishment of the kingdom of God. And of course, uh, the church, we're the bride of Christ. We've been raptured out. We're with the Lord during this time period. We come again with Jesus Christ, Revelation 19, to, uh, to rule and reign with him. And apparently when we come back again, we're going to be having a banquet and a party because Jesus makes reference to it in Matthew 8, 11, where he says, And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So when the kingdom of seven uh, is established, there's a big banquet. When it says we're going to sit down, it's not to play bingo. Uh, it's to have a feast. That's the, uh, the implication. Which kind of throws into array this idea that after the rapture of the church, the church will experience the wedding supper of the Lamb in heaven during the tribulation. Uh, that doesn't really fit this passage. It doesn't really fit uh, a Jewish picture of a wedding anyway. The way in most of the parables Jesus talks about the rapture of the church in this age, he uses a Jewish wedding as, uh, uh, as his uh, example or his metaphor. In a Jewish wedding, the bridegroom comes for the bride. Jesus has got a, a parable about that. Be ready. Watch and pray. You don't know the hour, you know, right? Uh, there in Matthew 25, 10. Watch, therefore, you don't know the, de the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So be ready. That's a message to us as, be uh, as believers. Watch and be ready. What happens then? Well, according to the Jewish model, we are taken with the bridegroom and we're taken to the Father's house. And that's what's going to happen uh, during the rapture. Is there a feast? Not yet. We're just there. We're there. I'm sure we're having a good time. But it's not a big feast. But then after that, after that time period in the Jewish wedding context, then the bride, groom, will bring the bride back to her house again. And that's where the wedding supper of the Lamb is. So if you follow the Jewish model in all this, it sure looks the, like the wedding supper of the Lamb takes place here on earth in the kingdom when the kingdom is established and the millennial reign of Jesus Christ begins uh, to happen here. And so there's incredible blessings in the future uh, for the nation of Israel. We've got to get uh, uh, Jacob on his deathbed here, though, so hang in here with me. The inheritance of the land is a basis for a final command, verses 28 to 33. All these are the 12 tribes of Israel, and this is what their father spoke to them. And he blessed them. He blessed each one according to his own blessing. Then he charged them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron, the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is uh, before Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron, the Hittite, as a possession or a burial place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that there were purchased from the sons of Haith. And when Jacob had finished commanding his sons, he drew his feet up into his bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. Pretty radical, right? I mean, he does this whole thing and then gives them this 
One last charge. And by the way, he says, I charge you. It means I command you. I command you do this one last thing. Then he pulls his feet up in his bed and he's, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's with the Lord. He's in, uh, we'd say, Abraham's bosom. But uh, again, the 12 tribes uh, are blessed in that sense. Uh, but uh, they end up in the tomb. Why does Jacob do this? Because he believes the promises of God. He doesn't see it. Abraham was buried there. Abraham never got to see the fact that God gave Israel the land. I mean, he never saw it. He believed it, but he said he believed it was yet future. Isaac, the same way. He's buried there, believing that it was still going to happen. It was still yet future. And Jacob says... Listen, things may be pretty cushy in uh, Egypt right now, but don't leave me here. You take me back to the land because I believe God's word and I believe God's promises. And he says, one day that land will be ours. And he tells each and every one of us, do you believe you're going to be in heaven one day? Do you see it? No, but you believe it anyway. And Jesus says, blessed are you for the things you haven't seen. We're like Jacob. Again, that's why they bring these guys over into the New Testament, Hebrews 11, and say, these guys are models of faith. It's not because they always got it right, as we've studied their life. They actually botched a lot of stuff. Uh, they didn't always start out too good, but they all seemed to finish well. What an awesome way to finish, saying, I believe the promises of God. Poof, <laughs> he's, he's gone. What an awesome statement to make to your kids and uh, in the timing uh, of it all. It, interesting. I'll just show you one last picture. This is the tomb there. Uh, Sorry, I must be getting excited here. I can't keep my microphone on. But that's, uh, you notice those minarets at the top. That's not a typical Jewish feature of, uh, of a tomb. Uh, the uh, Muslims uh, built those at one point in time. Because they have this thing about going into a Jewish site and kind of remaking it and reclaiming it as their own. It's created a lot of problems. It's in Hebron, which was in the West Bank. So Jews had no access to it for thousands of years. After, again, after the 67 war, they could actually go. You understand why this is kind of a special spot? Abraham, Sarah, you know, Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob, Leah, all got buried there because they believed what? God was going to give them the land. Just slightly important to Jewish people, especially those living in Israel. No access until 1967. Lots of problems there, though. There's been several times that uh, because it's such a sacred site, they'd be having a bar mitzvah, a wedding. And of course, on the other side now is a mosque of this whole thing, right in this, this whole compound. So people would throw, throw bombs and stuff right down in the middle of the bar mitzvah or the wedding or whatever. Uh, tragic things. It's happened the other way. An American Jewish guy that was living there uh, from that site, the Jewish side, as, uh, as uh, a gathering of Muslims were there, opened fire and killed several. That, that happened not that long ago. A lot of animosity and stuff going on in this site, but a site that is uh, uh, incredibly sacred to, uh, to the Jewish people uh, because of the fact that uh, Jacob says, take me there because God's going to keep his word. For us, hey, Jesus says, watch and pray. You don't know the hour when he's going to come. I think we'll have a pretty good time in heaven, but I think we're coming back here for a big party afterwards. As Jesus comes and we watch him overtake the forces of the Antichrist, rescue that six million Jewish people out there on the plains of Jordan, comes back, his robes splatter in blood at that point, stands on the Mount of Olives, it splits in two, he declares his victory, judges the nations, whether they've been Semitic or anti-Semitic for 45 days, Daniel says, and then we initiate that kingdom, and I think that's when we have a big party. I'm not sure about those royal dainties that uh, someone's going to be prepared, but uh, I hope they got some sashimi. That's all I got to say. Let's pray. In dark black space.